Well, we got a lot of good stuff to talk about this week, which we'll do in a couple of minutes. Let me bring you up to speed on where we are with the backpack program. Uh, as per the previous weeks, I had said that last year we had bought 30 backpacks for 30 kids going back to school at a cost of 250 each. There they are in the vehicle to be delivered. There's the stuff we pack it with. Um, that costs 7500 This year, I want a minimum of 40 at a cost of $300 each because uh, we uh, have the possibility of getting a deal on Galaxy tablets. $12,000 is an increase of $4,500. And I said uh, for the next four weeks uh, for my videos on YouTube for the Market Outlook videos, we have July uh, 17th and 24th done. We still have July 31st, which is uh, the one that you're watching now. And there'll be one more on August 7th that every time somebody clicks like, I will donate another dollar. Every time somebody subscribes while they're watching that video, I will donate another dollar and all revenue from the video will be donated as well. Uh, so July 17th uh, is now up to 1583.39. July 24th has generated 1384. It's a little bit lower. I've had uh, some subscribers actually donate some good money in the comment section using the thank you button. And uh, for this week, if you want to do something like that, I'm going to direct you right uh, to a site. Use the first link in the description box to do that. Because if you uh, go to this site, which is Big Brothers Big Sisters, and you donate uh, $20, they get $20. If you do it through YouTube, YouTube takes 30%. So YouTube uh, wants to get their hands in the pie on that one as well. So uh, rather than using the YouTube feature, go right to the website. Go right to uh, the first link, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters, if you uh, feel motivated to do something here. Uh, why is this lower than this? Uh, well, uh, likes were down by 265. 265 more people liked this video than this video. So even if you don't like the video, make me pay a dollar. If you think, oh, I don't like this guy, then make me pay a dollar. Click on the like button and make me pay a dollar. Uh, same with subscribers. Subscribers were down 85 on this video versus this video, even though the revenue of this video was greater than the revenue of this video. Uh, it uh, took a hit on the uh, likes and the subscribers. So if you're not subscribed and you're watching this video, if you hit subscribe, I donate another dollar. If you hit like at the same time, I donate another dollar. Then hit pause, go back to July 17th and July 24th and hit like on each of those two. You don't even have to watch them. Just click like, make me pay another dollar. Either way, we're at uh, 3,000 bucks. Uh, just on that alone, the target was minimum uh, 45. Remember, minimum, I'd like to go as high as I can. We're two thirds of the way there on just two videos and there are two more to go. So we are gonna make that 45, which means uh, we probably will be increasing our minimum from 40 to whatever number we can get it to. So if you do feel motivated to uh, to give to the program, uh, to uh, other than just using the, you know, for me, it's enough just to click on like and subscribe and make me pay the money. I'm good with that. But if you want to do something a little bit more, don't use the YouTube feature that says give uh, or anything, uh, 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 whether it's a super like or anything like that. Don't use that feature. Go to the description box. Look at the first link in the description box. That'll take you right to Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Niagara. They get 100% of the funds uh, that you, uh, that you, uh, you know, feel motivated to donate if, if that is what you wanted to do. Okay, let's head in. We have a lot to cover this week. Big week. We had earnings. We had the uh, FOMC meeting, uh, which was a disaster, really, uh, the press conference. We'll get into that. Had uh, GDP, which uh, if you dig deep into the GDP report, we'll find out that it wasn't that bad. Uh, PCE on Friday and the Employment Cost Index, and those weren't very great. However, uh, we did rally, uh, and uh, I think this is the best rally we've had since the bear market uh, began. I think we're up 12% 12, 12 off, the, off the lows. Uh, so, you know, that's not bad. Let's look at our rates. It should be no surprise uh, here that uh, our money market rates uh, from the one month up to the six month last week hit the highs of the year. 
uh, and then all other rates dropped. And even though they hit the high of the year, uh, this is uh, July 25th. Uh, it, uh, for example, the three month hit 262, but but settled on by the time we got to the 29th, settled at 2.41. So even though they hit the highs of the year during last week, by the time we got into Friday, uh, some of these market rates gave back. Uh, you know, the three month giving back eight basis points uh, week over week on a week where the Fed raised interest rates 75 basis points, you know, it makes you stop and think, is the market uh, is the market thinking something different? We'll see when we get to real rates. The market doesn't believe that the Fed is going to carry out its mandate. All the capital market rates uh, gave back. Uh, everything is inverted from the twos forwards. 289 down to 283. 283 down to 2.7 sideways here. 2.7 down to 2.67 from the twos to the tens. So another one basis point uh, drop on the uh, on the slope. We're inverted now at 22 basis points. That's now 24 days that we've been inverted as of Friday. But you know nothing happens Saturday and Sunday. So you can say we are now 26 days inverted. Now. Um, Every recession has been preceded by an inverted yield curve, you know, two to three quarters before the recession happens. But not every inverted yield curve leads to a recession. However, the deeper the uh, inversion and the longer the inversion, the higher the probability of the recession. That's why we're uh, counting the days now. We're now 26 days inverted and we're uh, down 22 basis points. Uh, up here, let's look up here for a second, 2.22. The uh, target range for the Fed is now 2.25 uh, to 2.5%. Uh, so if this is the overnight rate, if this is the low end on the overnight rate, why are we seeing 2.22 here? You know, And if we have 2.5 as the upper end of the range, and this is for two months and this is overnight, shouldn't this be somewhere around 250 or higher? Not until you get to the six month, you exceed the upper part of the range at 291. But from the uh, one month all the way to the three month, we're below the 2.5. And the one month is below the lower bound of 2.25. Um, if you can access the reverse repo facility from the Fed, you will do that and you will get 2.25% on overnight uh, funding. But not everybody can. And there is a shortage of T-bills in the market. Everybody wants them. If banks could buy one-day T-bills, they would. They need to buy T-bills with zero price risk in it whatsoever. Well, that's the repo window or, and the reverse repo window. It's zero price risk. Other um, institutions that cannot access uh, the Fed's uh, reverse repo facility but need these T-bills because they need a return... Uh, an overnight return or a money market uh, rate of return without any price risk has have to buy these things. So that's why uh, you're seeing 2.22, which is below the 2.25. No bank is going to take the 2.22. They will access the reverse repo window and grab 2.25. Everybody else has to buy whatever else they can get. So market demand and supply conditions are determining the rate there rather than monetary policy. Let's look at the Fed balance sheet over the uh, course of July. We've already solved uh, the problem of the increasing value in MBS. It deals with settlement when they're buying in the uh, yet-to-be-issued market. So we still might expect some settlement going into August and September, but pretty much dying off after that. Um, as of July 6th, uh, it, the balance sheet dropped $20.7 billion, uh, week ending July 13th up 1 million, which is basically same as saying zero. Uh, July 20th, an increase of 5.8 billion. Treasuries dropped, but MBS really increased. Again, it's that settlement. July 27th, $8.9 billion drop. So overall, uh, through July, we're not going to know all of July until we see next week's in August, but uh, $23.8 billion drop in the balance sheet. It's going in the right direction. Once the uh, settlement issues from the MBS uh, filter out and are done, then we should start to see much more significant decreases per month. Let's look at credit spreads. How did they respond last week? OAS across investment grade, high yield, and in investment grade, we'll look at uh, AA. 
uh, and triple B and high yield double B and uh, triple C or lower uh, all unchanged given that uh, you know once you start getting into uh, some of these bonds down here they're fairly illiquid uh, to begin with uh, that any movement around here is probably just a function of the bid and ask being different than the week before all unchanged basically you know two basis points this way one basis point that way i wouldn't say that the market is thinking anything other than just normal transactions going on looking at the fed funds futures for october uh, there's a september meeting so we'll use october fed funds futures the uh, fed funds futures uses the average price uh, over uh, the 30 days prior to the uh, expiration so uh, if there is a meeting midway through one of the futures contracts, it's going to pick up half of that. So we want a clean month. There's nothing going on in October. We get a clean month. 2.91. The midpoint of the current range now, 2.375. Expected move of 50 basis points, 107%, which means the market is all but pricing that in. And, uh, and the small, small chance of maybe it's a little bit more. Um, we'll see... Uh, next week if this uh, starts to decrease down below 100%, in other words, if this increases from 97.09 upwards, would imply the probability of anything more than 50 basis points dropping as well. If we use 75 as the denominator, 71.3%, which is, which is low uh, on a probability basis. So the market's not seeing much of a chance of 75 they're all but pricing in 50 and then just leaving some room for a little bit more. Um, if we look at what the Fed ought to do, uh, I think that the market is underpricing the probability of 75. If we look at what the Fed will do, I think it's probably overpricing the 50. We go to January to look at the terminal rate for the end of the year. Uh, we're using January again because there's a December meeting and we want a clean month. 96.69, 3.31, take the mid part of the range now. We're expecting, or the market's expecting 100 basis points. We've got September at 50, followed by uh, two uh, 25s to get to 100. It's not pricing in anything more than that. The market is seeing another 100 basis points and then stopping. And then just a few months after that, let's bring those rates back down. The market is already pricing in rate cuts. Uh, uh, already pricing in rate cuts as early as March. So the Fed's going to raise rates, hang out there for a couple of weeks, five or six weeks, and then start cutting rates. That's never, ever, ever happened. So when we look at the base rate, the probability of that happening, the base rate is how many times has that actually happened where the Fed has raised rates and within three months started to drop rates? Zero. Yet, yet the market is pricing that in. The market's pricing that in. Let's go look at uh, our real yields. This is the big story. Look at the drop in these real yields. Look at the five-year over here. It is now negative. We're back in negative territory on real yields on the five-year. The seven-year threatening negative territory. The 10-year is only 14 basis points away from entering negative territory. Um, this is reflecting a higher demand for tips. So if there's more demand, the price of tips increases, which means it lowers the yields if somebody's willing to accept a negative real yield. They must have some view on the break-even rates. So here are the break-even rates. So let's look at the five-year break-even rate of 2.73. This is saying that the average inflation rate over that period of time at 2.73, if it were 2.73, we should be indifferent between buying a five-year treasury with a nominal coupon versus buying a five-year tips with a real coupon because, well, we think that's the right number. If we think the average inflation rate over those five years is going to be greater than 2.73, we would prefer the tips. If we think it's going to be less than 2.73, we would prefer the nominal coupon bond. Being that we have this kind of change in yields on tips, is the market saying, oh, no, 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 these break-even rates, we're betting against those break-even rates and that's what they've done. Higher demand for tips, lower real yields. This is supportive of higher present values. 
So we know that when we use discounted cash flow, we have our numerator, which is some measure of cash flow, whether it be dividends or free cash flow or residual income. Our denominator is a discount rate. Well, the discount rate has dropped. So every dollar of cash flow is going to be worth more. Uh, we're not making any uh, kind of statement on uh, the magnitude of the cash flows. It could be that uh, we're entering into a period where cash flows are going to be lower. That could be. So to say that it's supportive of higher stock prices is not as true as saying it's higher. It's supportive of higher present values. So every dollar of cash flow is now worth more today than it was a week ago. But there's no saying that those dollars will be greater or less. So I'm not saying anything about the numerator, just the discount rate. Mortgage rates. Big story on mortgage rates here. Look at this, the 30-year uh, fixed, 513. On uh, July 17th, it was 5.72. For the FHA mortgage, 4.62. Uh, two weeks ago, it was 5.52. That's 90 basis point drop. It dropped 40 basis points just after the GDP report on its own. This is supportive of higher housing prices. The lower mortgage rates go, the higher housing prices uh, can be uh, rationalized by a buyer because they manage this monthly payment. Uh, let's see if I can get uh, some writing within that uh, thing that manage that monthly payment. So look at what has uh, happened in the last week. The Fed has raised interest rates 75 basis points, but monetary policy has gotten looser. Lower real yields. On the previous screen, we saw lower uh, yields on capital market bonds, lower um, mortgage rates, at one point, this was over 6%, 6.25. Uh, mortgage rates in the last six weeks have fallen by 100 basis points. Treasury yields, have, uh, since they hit the bottom on uh, June 14th, have uh, increased, or sorry, have decreased significantly. Just look at the 10-year. Hit 3.49 on June 14th, it's 2.67. That's 75 basis points down. Yields have come down 75 basis points over the last six weeks, while the federal funds rate has gone up 75 basis points. Mortgage rates down by more than 100 basis points. Real yields now negative. This is a loosening of financial conditions, not a tightening of financial conditions. It is the wrong way, and it all comes down to one sentence. The bumbling buffoon of a Fed chair is... Uh, uh, one sentence that he said, and we'll look at that sentence uh, uh, shortly. Mortgage, app we're not going to see the effect of this, by the way, in mortgage applications and in uh, median listing prices uh, for two weeks because this is ending July 23rd. Um, we get this on Wednesday, but it's for the previous uh, the previous week. So it's going to be two weeks before we see these lower rates work their way through the system. Mortgage apps down 1.8%, refis down 3.7%, purchases down 0.77%. None of that is very surprising. However, uh, you know, since the 17th, we've come down uh, a good uh, 60 basis points on the 30 year fixed and on the uh, Federal Home Association uh, loans, um, guaranteed loans, we've gone down 90 basis points, just that much after the. Uh, uh, the GDP report on its own. MBS rallied last week. Well, all bonds rallied last week. And when mortgage-backed security prices go up, yields come down, and mortgages are pegged uh, to the yield on uh, MBS. On, and different rates are pegged to different types of MBS. Um, but uh, this, this is supportive of housing prices. This is supportive of higher present values. None of this is a tightening of monetary policy. In the last two weeks, we have seen a significant loosening of financial conditions, not tightening of financial conditions. So um, that one statement that Jerome Powell made has undone the last two meetings of rate hikes. Has He's undone them, or undid them, undone them. We'll see what that means shortly. Um, from Realtor.com, median listing prices for the week ending July 23rd up 16.6% over last year. Same with last week, 16.6%. The week before was 15.9%. Year to date's 147 So it is moderating because the year to date is lower. 
New listings, uh, they're down uh, 6% uh, for the week ending year over year, but active listings are up 30%. Well, that speaks to uh, inventory, right? So you have a higher level of inventory and it's moving slower. Uh, for the year, it's still seven days faster, but at the beginning of the year, homes were selling nine days faster over the same period last year. Then it went to eight, then seven, then six. This was one day, one day. Now it's selling at the same speed as last year. So you had a, a situation of rising inventory. You had slower home sales uh, that were beginning to happen. Uh, and if we look at transaction prices, it wasn't showing up there yet. Transaction prices were still the highest on record. Uh, and our listing prices are still 16.6 uh, year over year. That's not going to do much to fix the shelter component of uh, CPI and of PCE unless you keep it going in the same direction. That's over. Uh, since uh, mortgage rates topped, again, this was over 6%. Mortgage rates are down uh, over 100 basis points in the last five to six weeks. They're down over 100 basis points. That, that just wiped out everything you did uh, to try to get shelter prices down. You just wiped it out. Let's go uh, have a look at what, uh, what this person said. Okay, let's uh, read the statement. We'll listen to the opening statement that Powell makes. And in his opening statement, nothing, nothing wrong with that. Everything is fine. It's in a follow-up statement that he makes. I think it's like 15 seconds long where he says something he shouldn't have said. He says two things he shouldn't have said in this one, but we'll listen to all three clips. Uh, I've underlined the important things here. Recent indicators of spending and production have softened. Doesn't say have, have turned negative, just says it's softened, which is true. Recent indicators of spending and production have softened, although I question the spending part. I, I don't know if I would say it's softened. Nonetheless, job gains have been robust in recent months, and the unemployment rate has remained low. Um, inflation remains elevated. Notice he's talking about uh, the job market, he's talking about unemployment, and he's talking about inflation. Inflation remains elevated, reflecting supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic, higher food uh, and energy prices, and broader price pressures. This statement right here sets out the Fed mandate. It has um, two mandates, full employment, uh, and price stability. That's called a Phillips curve mandate. Uh, and that's it. That's their job. Um, unemployment rate has remained low. The labor market is tight. You can check that box. Inflation remains elevated. That box is not checked. That's the mandate. Let's keep going here. Uh, we can skip uh, this uh, statement here. Uh, the last sentence, the committee is highly attentive to inflation risks. So they're giving a nod to inflation. The committee seeks to achieve maximum employment. There's their first mandate. And inflation at the rate of 2%. There's their second mandate. Again, same with the first paragraph. Unemployment, inflation, unemployment, inflation. They're very well aware of what their mandates are. Uh, in support of these goals, the committee decided to raise the target rate for the federal funds rate to 2 and a quarter to 2.5% uh, and anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate. So they're signaling, hey, we're not done. Uh, the committee will continue reducing its holding, uh, holdings of treasury securities and agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities as described in the plans for reducing the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet that were issued in May. And we have seen that, yes, they are reducing their balance sheet. Let's say it again, though. The committee is strongly committed to returning inflation to its 2% objective. They mention inflation remains elevated. Our goal is 2% inflation. We are highly attentive to inflation risks. We are strongly committed to the 2% objective. So far, this sounds like the Fed that we've been reading about for the last couple of months when we look at the minutes, how they stress the importance of getting inflation under control. In assessing the appropriate stance of monetary policy, the committee will continue to monitor the implications of incoming information for the economic outlook. The committee would be prepared to adjust the stance of monetary policy as appropriate if risks emerge that could impede the attainment of the committee's goals. Those goals being maximum employment and inflation at the rate of 2%. Have they got this done? I'm stressing this. I want to be very clear. This is done. This is not. There is only one job. They have only one job. 
The committee's assessments will take into account a wide range of information, including readings on public health. Uh, so I put a, you know, why? That's not part of your mandate. Public health is not part of your mandate, nor is social justice. Uh, they spend a lot of time talking about unemployment rates between different skin pigmentations and different genders. They spend a lot of time talking about income inequality. I don't see anywhere up here, when you list off your two mandates, that any of those things are your mandates. That's, those are important issues, but those are issues for Congress. Those are not issues for the Federal Reserve. But somehow the Federal Reserve seems to be involved in everything these days, and they seem to have so many different mandates now. I'm not even sure if they know what their mandates are. So public health, labor market conditions, yes. Inflation pressures and inflation expectations, yes. And financial and international developments. Well, uh, from financial developments, they should have seen that, that, uh, that financial conditions loosened significantly last week, thereby undoing what they, what they did. Let's uh, listen to their opening statement, and we'll see that it is consistent uh, with what, we've, uh, what they've outlined here. Good afternoon. My colleagues and I are strongly committed to bringing inflation back down. There's and inflation again. we're moving again. expeditiously to do so. Expeditiously. We have both the tools we need and the resolve it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. The economy and the country have been through a lot over the past two and a half years and have proved resilient. It is essential that we bring inflation down to our 2% goal if we are to have a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. Essential, he said. From the standpoint of our congressional mandate to promote maximum employment and price stability, he's aware of his mandate. The current picture is plain to see. Plain to see. The labor market is extremely tight and inflation is much too high. Period. So that was the opening statement. It started off well. It matches everything here, and it matches everything we've read so far. So all, uh, while I was watching it, I was thinking, okay, nothing here has changed. You've moved 75. You're going in the right direction. It's time to signal to the market that this is, this is a fight that you're willing to fight. Until he said this. As the stance of monetary policy tightens further, it likely will become appropriate to slow the pace of increases while we assess how our cumulative policy adjustments are affecting the economy and inflation. That right there, that did it. That then began the rally because he's taken his eye off of the mandate. His mandate is full employment and price stability. We don't have price stability. We got full employment. However, he is saying that, you know, we are seeing some uh, uh, slowdown in some particular areas. He's going to pivot to the economy. They have, they've, they've suspended forward guidance, which is a good thing, because when you have forward guidance and you say, I think this is going to happen, I think that's going to happen, the motivation is to then start to conduct policy to make sure those very things happen, as opposed to conducting policy to pay attention to your mandates. Um, but in saying that, you know, we think that we're going to slow some of these things, uh, he's not paying attention to his mandate anymore. Uh, he is now pivoting towards the economy. They've given us projections that they're going to have this beautiful, perfect soft landing. The plane is going to land in a fog with a cross current, and you're not even going to know that the tires have hit the tarmac. You're not even going to know it. So he's going to try to balance inflation with an economy getting too soft. Oh, 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 we're slowing down over here. Let's slow the pace of uh, uh, rate hikes. Let's see if we can't get this to come back up. And then if inflation is a little hot, let's raise rates a bit more. Then we'll slow it down. This, if you go back in Fed history, was 1975 to 1978 under Arthur Burns. It was exactly the same thing. Didn't want a recession, uh, but didn't want inflation. So he'd raise rates, he'd see the economy slow down, he'd see inflation come down, he would think, job done, let's go save the economy, let's stop raising rates. The economy would improve, but so would inflation. Okay, let's run back over here and let's raise rates. And okay, we raise rates, okay, inflation's going the right way, but the economy's slowing down. Whoa, whoa, let's run back over here and let's stop raising rates. Let's try to save the economy. There we go. Oh, but inflation, let's run back and... 
and he's uh, now known as the most incompetent Fed chair that ever was. And Paul Volcker came in, and Paul Volcker was an oak tree. He planted his, his roots there, and he said, we are doing this, and that's it, and he was not swayed by anything. Um, chair Powell is not an oak tree. He is a reed. He bends in the wind. So now, uh, up to now, I've been looking at, uh, you know, the two mandates of what the Fed has and what they're going to do. And what they're going to do was based on what they ought to do. Kind of a very platonic way to look at it. Plato uh, would uh, uh, describe the world of perfect forms, describe men as they ought to be. Aristotle chided him one time and said, you cannot. Uh, describe men as they ought to be. You have to describe them as they are. So now I have to bring that variable in to the forecasting of what the Fed will do. I have to look at what they ought to do. Then I have to consider that Fed uh, that Powell is a reed and he bends in the wind and it's not what he ought to do, it's what he will do. Will he bend towards the economy even though his job isn't done? Will he take on multiple mandates? I'm here to save the market. I got to save the economy. Even though nobody has lost jobs and we still have job gains, I'm seeing a slowdown. Can't let that happen. I mean, those people of different skin pigmentations are going to lose their job. People of different genders are going to lose their job. He's going, he's going to bend in the wind and he will be another Arthur Burns. So at this point, I think that you have probably uh, multiple years of elevated inflation ahead if he does that. I don't know if he's going to do it, but I can't discount it now after that statement. And if you think I'm reading too much into it, there is yet another statement that he made, and I'll sum it up for you. I'll let you hear it, but it basically goes like this. You really think any of this stuff works? Do you really think that if we raised interest rates earlier, any of this stuff would have worked? Central banks were raising interest rates. We still have inflation. This shit don't work. My God, why would you say something so stupid? You know, I uh, have for a while said that higher interest rates aren't going to solve this inflation problem. So I shouldn't be upset that he's saying we need to slow the pace down. But I am because you have to work on expectations. Yes, go ahead and slow the pace of rates down in the year, but don't tell everybody that's what you're going to do because they then will respond as if that is going to happen. Case in point, we have mortgage rates that are 100 basis points lower than they were. We have treasury yields that rallied. We have real yields that are starting to turn negative again. And if you look at the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, last week. The very prices we want to come down have rallied. The commodity index is up 7.1% from the June lows. They were up 4.5%. Of that 7.1, 4.5% came just last week and 1.4% of it came just from the Fed statement. Again, undoing everything that they've done with that one stupid statement. Now, let's listen to his next stupid statement. Um, but did it matter in the end? You know, we, if you look at, um, I, I really don't think it did. I, I'm not sure it would have mattered if we'd, if we'd been raising rates three months earlier. Does anybody think that would have made a big difference? I mean, lots of central banks were raising rates three months earlier, and it, it didn't matter. What a bumbling baboon. Okay, let's have a look at uh, GDP for the second quarter. It's the first look for the second quarter. They are subject to revisions. Um, seasonally uh, uh, adjusted annual rate, this is the contribution to real GDP, consumption 0.7. This is real now. That means nominal was much, much higher. It's just you're taking the nominal GDP and you're taking out the price effect just to get to the real GDP. Consumer uh, was 0.7% contribution to real GDP. Goods down 1.08, but services up 1.78. Uh, investment, negative 2.73, uh, mostly from a change in inventory, negative 2.01. Fixed investment down uh, 0.72. Government spending down 0.33. I always think this is a good thing uh, when government spending goes down. Yes, it takes away from uh, real GDP. 
uh, but it reduces the amount of taxation that you're eventually going to have to steal from people to pay for that uh, profligateness anyways. Exports minus imports, 1.43. It added uh, exports way up, imports way down. And we uh, this is a reversal of what we saw in the first quarter where uh, the uh, amount of inventory that hit the U.S. shores, especially in March, brought uh, GDP negative. That was not an activity. Well, you know, it's all activity, but it wasn't so much a general part of activity as a curiosity of the supply channel. That's all it was. It was reflecting something other than real economic activity. It was just reflecting the technicality of when this stuff lands. And I'm going to show you that this is now reflecting the technicality of what is going on here. Uh, inventories did not drop. Inventories actually increased. There was an addition to inventories. However, the line item that's measured here measures change in inventory, doesn't measure the level of inventory. So even though you can have an inventory build, it can show a detraction from GDP. I want you to think about that. Inventories increased, I think, $81 billion. Inventories went up in Q2 over Q1. However, it's showing that the because of the change in inventories, uh, it took away 2% 2 2 from GDP. So uh, if you add 2% back to GDP, you have positive GDP, much as if we had amended Q1 GDP to take out that anomaly of all the inventory hitting the U.S. shores all, in, all at one time, you would have had positive GDP. Now, all of this adds up to negative 0.93. Add the 2.01 uh, 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 back in, you had over 1% real GDP growth. If we're looking quarter over quarter, um, this is uh, annualized. This is the quarter annualized. If we're just looking quarter over quarter, uh, Consumption expenditures grew 1% quarter over quarter. Goods down 4.4% quarter over quarter. Services up 4.1%. Quarter over quarter, uh, investment down 13.5%. Uh, from fixed investment is negative 3.9%. Residential down 14 Well, uh, we heard a lot of that from the home builders. As the cost of credit increases, the amount of uh, activity in that sector drops. Uh, government spending quarter over quarter down 1.9%, defense up uh, uh, 2.5%, non-defense down 10.5%. That sounds like a lot. What's that from? That is from a very particular thing. That is from the release uh, of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves. Because if you release a barrel of oil from there, uh, refineries don't have to buy a barrel of oil from somewhere else. So it actually gives the illusion of lower economic activity. It's just the same economic activity. It's just you're serving that economic activity from inventory. So this drop over here is really reflecting uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve release. Still, if they hadn't released it, that would have registered as economic activity, which would have made GDP even more positive. So this non-defense, this big drop, quarter over quarter is the release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves. Exports uh, quarter over quarter up 18%. Quarter over quarter. Imports only up 3.1% quarter over quarter. And uh, for the second quarter, GDP uh, gives us a bunch of price indexes. Actually, you get a whole table from table four. If you look at table four, you get price indexes on every line item. Uh, PCE excluding food and energy. This is uh, 2022 over here. This is 2021, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and this is Q1, Q2. So PCE, excluding food and energy for the second quarter is 4.4%. Market-based PCE, this is interesting. Um, so what the market-based PCE does is saying, look, there are a bunch of line items where we have to impute a price. It's not visible. For example, owner's equivalent rent. We, we, that's not a visible thing. We can't really see that. Services that are provided that don't have a cost. Well, we can't really see those services that are provided that don't have a cost, but they're still provided. So their prices are imputed. This is just what you can actually observe in the market. 8.1%. 
uh, if we're relying on market prices, 8.1%. And if you take the market-based PCE and exclude food and energy, which we can compare it to the PCE here with imputed prices, 5.1%. Market-based pricing, once you start including imputed prices, which means, look, there's no price for this, so let's just make up a price. Uh, owner's equivalent rent, there's a big you know, uh, disadvantage of using that, is that it's not really a market-based price now, is it? So is it understated? Is it overstated? Well, if we just rely on market-based prices, the uh, PCE, again, excluding food and energy, is coming in at 5.1%. Let's go look at the uh, at some of the tables in the GDP report. Okay, let's do a little bit of reading here. Here's our uh, news release. A decrease in real GDP reflected decreases in private inventory investment, residential fixed investment, federal government spending, state and local government spending, and non-residential fixed investment that were partly offset by increases in exports and personal consumption expenditures. Imports, which were uh, which are a subtraction in the GDP calculation, uh, increased. The decrease in private inventory investment was led by a decrease in retail trade as well as motor vehicle uh, dealers. While we know that uh, car companies have been telling us for quite some time, we simply just can't get the inventory out there. General Motors at the end of the quarter said, we're sitting on 95,000 cars. We can't deliver because we don't have the chips. Uh, well, those are 95,000 vehicles that would have otherwise been delivered. So is this a drop in demand or is this just yet more a drop in supply, right? The decrease in residential fixed investment was led by a decrease in other structures, specifically brokers' commissions. Now, the decrease in federal government spending reflected a decrease in non-defense spending. The decrease in non-defense spending reflected the sale of crude oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which results in a corresponding decrease in consumption expenditures. Because the oil sold by the government enters private inventories, there is no direct net effect on GDP. Current dollar GDP. This is nominal. Current dollar GDP increased 7.8% at an annual rate. Uh, in the first quarter, GDP increased 6.6. .6. So the nominal GDP was 6.6 .6 in Q1 is 7.8 in Q2. The price index for gross domestic purchases increased 8.2% in the second quarter compared with 8% in the first quarter. So it's higher. The PCE price index, this is just for personal consumption. This is the price index for all GDP. This is the price index just for personal consumption. Increased 7.1%, the same rate as the first quarter. So no uh, let up there. Excluding food and energy, the PCE price index increased 4.4% compared with 5.2. So the core dropped from 5.2 to 4.4 in the second quarter. Personal incomes, current dollar personal income, this is nominal, increased 353.8 billion compared with an increase of 247.2 in the first quarter. Uh, personal incomes, this is an aggregate amount, comes from two components, the number of people working and the quantity of money each person makes. So if you have more people working, but they don't get paid more than anybody else, you'll still have increases in personal incomes. If you have the same people working and they're getting raises, that will result in an increase in personal incomes. So when we're looking, well, how much spending power is there in the malls on the weekends? This is what we look at because they spend their nominal dollars and they buy stuff. Uh, so in the second quarter, uh, there was $353.8 billion on an annualized basis, more than there was in the first quarter. Disposable personal income, this is after your taxes, increased $291.4 billion or 6.6% in the second quarter. Now, if we go up here and we look at the PCE price index, it increased 7.1. Disposable income increased 6.6. .6. That includes food and energy. Now, in contrast to a decrease of 1.3% in the first quarter. So in the first quarter, real disposable personal income, or sorry, not real, nominal, disposable personal income uh, decreased 1.3% in the first quarter, increased 6.6% in the second. That doesn't sound like an economy that got worse. That sounds like an economy that got better. 
real disposable personal income. There, now we're going to um, account for inflation. Decreased 0.5% compared with a decrease of 7.8% in the first quarter. 0.5, from negative 7.8 to negative 0.5, uh, from negative 1.3 to positive 6.6. .6. Sounds like the second quarter got really good. Personal savings was $968 billion in the second qu uh, quarter compared with $1.02 trillion. The personal savings rate was 5.2% in the second quarter, 56 in the first quarter. This 5.2, uh, the vast majority of it uh, is um, uh, non-discretionary savings. So uh, any um, contribution you're making to, uh, any payroll contribution you're making to, any, re any uh, uh, retirement plan, whether it's government-sponsored, whether it's a defined benefit, defined contribution, that is part of your savings rate. So when I say that 70 to 80% of people spend every single penny they make, it's whatever they get in their paycheck, whatever lands in their bank, they will spend almost every penny of it. Um, so the thinking is, well, how can there be a 5.2% savings rate if they spend every penny? Is because that 5.2%, that savings rate happens at source deductions. So uh, those amounts are taken off of their check and put into registered uh, savings plans before they even get their paycheck. They spend 100% of whatever it is that they get. And we see that they're going home with more in the second quarter, aggregate quantity, never mind about the purchasing power of it, but aggregate quantity, they're going home with more, they're gonna spend it. And if they can't buy, uh, you know, uh, a new car they'll go buy something else it's not as if they're they're gonna say well I was gonna put you know five thousand dollars down on a car and finance the rest but I can't get the car I want I won't spend the five thousand no they'll go spend the five thousand on other stuff it's not as if they won't spend it they will spend it uh, okay let's go to table three let me show you the inventory number and uh, with that becomes a, a an interesting question that we have to ask Change in private inventories. Here we are here uh, at the top of uh, this column here. This is 2022. This is Q1. This is Q2. So this total up here, 19,727, this is billions of chained dollars. And this is seasonally adjusted. This is just billions of dollars. This is nominal. This is real. So we're looking at uh, how real GDP dropped 2% because of changes in inventories, we have to look at real numbers, not nominal numbers. So if we add up all the bold numbers down this column, it should add up to 19,727. Now these are aggregates. So if we look at personal consumption, that's how much actually happened at, at, at a seasonal rate. That's not how much happened in the quarter. But if you take the quarter and you annualize it, that's how much this Q1 and Q2 uh, uh, correspond to if you were to annualize those rates. So let's go down and look at inventory. Notice that everything else, gross private domestic investment, fixed investment, that is a sum. That's a total aggregate. All of these are total aggregates, but change in private inventories. That is not a level, that's a change. All the others are levels. This is just a change in inventory. Uh, so if we look over here, Q1 inventories increased. This is not the level now, this is just a change. Increased by 188.5 in Q2, inventories increased by 81.6. Increased. The problem was it increased more in Q1 than in Q2. So if you look at quarter over quarter, it shows a drop and there's your 2%. By the way, if you uh, take the 188.5, the change in inventory, and you look at it as a percentage of the, uh, of the change in GDP, or sorry, as a percentage of GDP, it's roughly about 1%. Um, so the question becomes, which is uh, you know a pretty good question, how can you actually have a build in inventories of 81.6 billion in real dollars? You had a build in inventory, yet somehow it shows that that contributed to negative 2% in GDP. For that, let's go to the black screen and I'll draw out a picture. Okay, let's take a company who's got revenues that are growing at 10%. It would not be unrealistic to see inventories also growing at 10 percent 
So let's say that uh, a company starts with 1 million in sales and ends with 1.1 million. That is its run rate of uh, revenues. And that it has inventory turnover of 25 times a year. It should start with 40,000 in inventory. Well, if it's going to maintain uh, 25x, if you divide that by 25, it should have 44,000 in inventory. Proportional to sales, inventory has not increased. However, inventory did increase by uh, 4,000. There was an increase. What if, in, what if inventories did this instead and increased to 42? Well, you have uh, a drop in the level of inventories relative to sales. You still had an increase in inventories, but you're actually increasing your inventory less than what the revenue amount would dictate. Why would you do that? You would start to do this if you expect going forward that revenues are not going to continue to grow at 10%, but are going to continue, to, or sorry, are either going to uh, soften, uh, slow down, or even contract. You would start to reduce your inventory ahead of that. That has um, one of two consequences. You're right. And that was the right thing to do. And you will observe a contraction in sales. So that this is a leading indicator of what is going to happen here. So we can look at company and we can look at country inventory levels. And we can imply something based on what the inventory levels are saying. That if inventory levels or inventory bills are not keeping pace with the current change in sales that we've seen, it must be anticipating a change in sales that are going to happen and is right-sizing inventory for this point in time rather than what they think or rather than, you know, this straight linear projection. Well, what if they're wrong? What if they're wrong and uh, sales continue to increase? Well, what's going to have to happen is you're going to have to have an inventory bill that has to compensate for how much you've lowered inventory for in the first part, plus a bill to get back uh, to where you were at whatever inventory turn that you wanted. Well, this is going to boost real GDP. If they're wrong, you're going to get a significant boost to real GDP. Now, look at, look at this. I want you to see the effect that this has. If a business whose sales are growing at 10% looks at the environment and everyone's talking about recession, all oh, rates are rising, consumption is going to slow, inflation is high, there's going to be a recession, this business may then start to adjust their inventory levels in advance of the decline in sales. And adjusting their inventory levels you get a negative 2.01% on GDP, thereby giving GDP the negative print that you were anticipating. That by affecting the level of inventories, you can affect the level of GDP, making it a self-fulfilling prophecy saying, good thing we lowered inventories, GDP is negative. However, it was the very lowering of the inventories that turned GDP negative. So now they're either gonna be right and you're going to have a recession, and that was the smart thing to do, or they're going to be wrong, and you're going to get this end-of-year boost in, uh, in inventory building into the Christmas season. That could happen. That by the time you get to September, we see that the job market is still very, very strong. We see that the consumer is still very, very strong, and businesses are going to say, uh, we have less inventory than what we really need. We need to build inventory quickly. Well, what happened the last time you built inventory really quickly? Uh, you had supply chain issues, you overwhelmed the system, and uh, you pushed up commodity prices significantly because you had to make all that inventory. And inventory is not intangible. Inventory is tangible. There's no such thing as intangible inventory because intangible inventory is infinite. If you ask Apple uh, on iTunes, how many songs have you got available for download? It's infinite. You can't, that's not even inventory. It's not even counted. It is infinite inventory. So we know that inventory is tangible. It's made of stuff. 
And if consumption, if, if the economy doesn't roll over, if things don't slow down, if Powell does pivot in September and signal that the pace of rate increases are going to slow down, that is going to embolden the consumer. You're going to have rates and yields dropping. You're going to have mortgage rates dropping. You're going to have interest rates on loans and credit cards dropping. You're going to have an inventory uh, rebuild that's going to happen very quickly into the fourth quarter, thereby pushing inflation back up to where it was, thereby undoing everything the Fed has done. Arthur Burns, anyone? That is your current Fed chair. We can stop calling him Jerome Powell and let's start calling him Arthur Burns. Okay, now just to, to be very clear, I, I don't believe that higher interest rates are going to solve certain problems. I don't think that higher interest rates are going to solve the automobile problem because the run rate of sales right now is already at recession levels. So even if you do create a recession, I don't see it fixing that. I don't see it fixing housing prices unless you really, really destroy that market. But you're only going to set the seeds for the next inflationary boom in housing because you're going to hollow out a supply. So I think, I think it is wise to look at the components of inflation and say, look, there's some parts that we can't do anything about. That's for Congress. That, that requires fiscal action and, and regulation or the reduction of regulation or immigration to solve those particular problems. But don't say it. Don't come out in a press conference and say, yeah, we have these two mandates, we're bloody serious about it, but, you know, we think we might slow it down at the end of the year uh, uh, in, a, in a few meetings because of this going on. And by the way, do you think this shit even works? It doesn't work. If we were raising rates three months ago, do you really think it would have made a difference? Everyone else was. It made no difference. Basically telling you, the head of the Fed saying, we don't believe in this stuff, really, doesn't really work. I mean, come on. Anyways, I think that slowing down the rate increases probably would have been the right thing to do because you were fighting a fight you couldn't win, but don't say it because you have to work on inflation expectations if you have a hope of containing inflation. And he just threw it out the window. Anyways, let's go to table four here. This is price indexes. Uh, for GDP and related measures. Every line item has a price index. So depending on what sector you play in, whether you play in consumer staples, uh, in, in consumer discretionary, in uh, utilities, in energy and materials, there's something here for you. Yeah, there's something here for everyone. Uh, you can get a separate price index just for goods and it breaks it down into durable goods. Look at that 1.4, which is what you would see. 10.8, uh, look, at, look at the uh, price difference here. Uh, in uh, 2021, you had elevated about 16.897, dropping to 6.5, dropping to 1.4. That's the right direction to go. The discretionary part, and durable goods are all discretionary, by the way, but the, the, the uh, discretionary part, that's where you want to see pricing come out. And by the way, consumer discretionary is highly uh, sensitive to changes in GDP. Uh, look at non-durables, uh, still very high, 15.5, right? And increasing, uh, it went from 5 to 5.9 to 9.8 to 15 to 15.5. What's going on in the non-durables? You'd want to have a look at that, right? Services, 5.4. Those are increasing. In fact, 5.4 is the highest in the series. 15.5 is the highest in the series. And notice for change in private inventories, there's no price index because they were inventory. It was inventory. There was no concept of a price in the inventory. It wasn't as if there was a change in the price. These were prices that were already established in previous periods, so you'd have no effect there. Uh, and then here are all your um, price indexes, PC excluding food and energy, uh, GDP excluding food and energy, 7%. That's uh, for all of GDP. The PC is just personal consumption, 4.4. We'll compare this with the actual uh, PCE report that came out. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, the GDP report has a lot of uh, a lot of neat stuff in there. On Friday, we've got uh, the PCE uh, price index along with the employment cost index. These are both released by the BEA. The first one is personal income and outlays. So it's not just the PCE that we're looking at. It gives us personal income 
in uh, um, current dollars and disposable personal income in both current and chain dollars. If we look at uh, June, here we are, we're looking at current dollars for disposable income. Uh, notice it's the highest uh, from all well, of the uh, months that they're showing of the five months, 0.7. Uh, this is what people see in their paycheck. They see uh, nominal dollars. They don't do the calculation uh, for inflation. They may feel inflation. They may say, oh, these prices are just increasing, but uh, look at my paycheck. My paycheck is bigger. And that does give them some security in their willingness to spend. They just may buy different things. But, you know, if they uh, take home $1,000 a week, uh, they will spend that $1,000 a week. Uh, they may spend it on different things. They may not drive their car as much. They may change the type of food that they're buying, but spend that $1,000, they will. Let's go down to the price indexes, PCE, 1%, PCE excluding food and energy, 0.6, not good. Look at the last uh, five months, February, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0 0.3, seem to be going in the right direction. Then you have 0.6 in June. Annualized, that's well over 7%. That's the core, over 7% on an annualized basis. If you took the one month rate of 0.6 and you annualized it, that's 1.006 to the power of 12 because of the rising 0.6% per month, uh, that is compounding, right? It rises 0.6% this month, then whatever price you have at the end of this month rises another 0.6%, then that rises. So it's not additive. Even if you add them up, you get to 7.2, but when you compound them, you get to greater than 7.2. The run rate, based on the one-month observation of PCE, the core is well over 7%. Not good. Now, when this came out, the market did retreat. It did drop, I think, about 15 or 20 points for uh, seven or eight minutes and then eh, up it went because the narrative from earlier in the week was way too powerful you had earnings for the most part nom and they're all nominal and the earnings for the most part that were beating the expectations even though the forward eps came down one percent so the forward eps has come down uh we're looking at this quarter, we had beats on earnings per share. However, not on cash flow. Cash flow told a different story, but that didn't matter because you have a Fed saying, we think that we're going to slow down the pace of rates. And besides, this stuff doesn't work. And you had negative GDP. You have a Fed saying, we think we're going to slow it down. Combined with the negative GDP, that cemented it. The Fed's going to pivot. They're going to pivot and they're going to run over and they're going to prop up the economy, even though employment, which is their other mandate, hasn't shifted a bit. That's the belief that we are not dealing with an oak tree. We are dealing with a reed. Uh, if you look year over year, this is, I think, where they found some solace. PCE excluding food and energy was 4.8% uh, um, based on where prices were last June, 48 But that is an averaging of the whole year. That's, that's taking the whole year into consideration. The acceleration that you're seeing in June from the other months, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, suddenly it jumped to 0.6. And you can't say, well, it's higher gasoline prices for summer driving because we're looking at... Uh, the PC excluding food and energy. That's a doubling. So that, uh, that is not good. Uh, but anyways, that, uh, that, that was, yeah, you know, uh, in the calculation of pricing for about seven or eight minutes, and then it all went away. And uh, off we went with a rally. So I was going to hedge out more in the morning. I thought, no, no, let's just see what happens. We got a powerful narrative. Let's just see what happens. And I was able to ride it into the close. Uh, and into the close, I added a little bit more negative delta. Uh, and when I say added more negative delta, in your portfolio, you're going to have long positions. And you will hedge out some of those long positions by adding negative delta against it. So that if the market goes down, you're not going to go down as much. Uh, you're not net short, but you're, you're certainly going to reduce your positive delta. As the market increases, you want to move that closer to zero. And if the market really increases, then you might want to start thinking about moving it into a negative, negative position. I am net negative on my delta uh, when I consider my core holdings. But when I consider all my other peripheral holdings, I am not. 
um, peripheral holdings you recall over the last couple of weeks I talked about selling puts on Nike Disney JP Morgan uh, who else did I do to buying I bought the Aussie dollar that was beautiful Aussie dollar, uh, uh, you know, really increased with high 67s, low 68s, and it uh, peaked over uh, over 70. That was nice. Let's move on. Okay, let's go to uh, table 11 in the uh, report, the PCE report. This is price indexes for personal consumption expenditure, percent change from month one year ago. So when we're looking at June, this is June 22 over June 21. You may be attempting to line these PCE indexes up with what we saw in Q2 GDP. In Q2 GDP, what we saw is Q2 over Q1. This is June of this year over June of last year. So while they may be close, they're not going to line up. So we have 6.8% this June over last June, but 7.1% is Q2 over Q1. So uh, this one here is showing more nearer term price uh, uh, price increases than this year over year. So we would be more apt to lean this way. For goods, 10.2 versus 10.4, pretty much in the same neighborhood. Durable goods, 1.4 quarter two over quarter one, but 6.1% year over year. So it is moving in the right direction. However, there's still a lot. There was still a... a increases throughout the year that show 6.1 from june to june but we are moving in the right direction it only even though it's 1.4 that still means a price increase in q2 over q1 but only 1.4 non-durables 15.5 in q2 over q1 year over year 13 they sort of tend to agree with each other services 5.4 quarter over quarter 4.9 year over year so just so that, uh, you know, if you were saying, how come this is 7.1, this is 6.8, none of these things line up. They're both PCE, shouldn't they line up? This is year over year, this is quarter uh, over quarter. So let's look at the market-based PCE. We have PCE excluding food and energy at 4.8%. If we use market-based PCE excluding food and energy, it is at 5.1%. So the imputed prices, being that they're not market-based, we might be able to make some argument that they may be understating the actual inflation rate. So that maybe we should be paying attention to market-based PCE excluding food and energy. Um, also on Friday, the Dallas Fed uh, released its uh, trimmed mean PCE. Let's have a look at that. Okay, so we have the one month PCE, the six month and the 12 month. How this works is you take the one month reading and you annualize it. Here you take the six month reading, whatever it is over the six month period, and you annualize it. And for 12 months, it's already annualized. If there is more near term price momentum, as we move from the 12 month to the six month to the one month, we should see it increase. So if we look at PCE, we have 6.8. If we look at it over a six month period, 7.7 .7, all the way to 12%. That's right, the headline PCE for, uh, for the month that was released, if you annualize it as 12%. Let's look at PCE X uh, food and energy, and we'll start with the one year. Year over year, 4.8. If you uh, look at it over six months, 4.8. Not much there, but look at it jump when you look at it uh, for uh, just the, the um, most recent month, 7.4. We'll look at the trimmed mean. This takes off the lowest price changes and the highest price changes and just looks at the, uh, the when it says the trimmed mean, it is what's in the middle, right? 6.9, highest in the series, 6.9, highest for the year. Uh, went from 4.3 to 4.8 to 6.9 if you take it year over year. If you look at six months annualized and you look at one month annualized, you're going from 4.3, 4.8 to 6.9, meaning that there's more near-term price momentum in the series than longer-term price momentum. If it went down the other way, then most of the price increases would have been historical, uh, not over the past uh, six months, which is what we have up here. Uh, if you click on this over here, components included and excluded from this month's trimmed mean, you'll get a spreadsheet which gives you all the line items of what they excluded, 
along with their price change and what they included. And then uh, um, we'll look at what they excluded on the low end and the high end in a second. This gives you a nice uh, chart as to the price action, uh, things that are moving more than 10%, things that are moving 5 to 10%, and gives you the percentage uh, over here. So uh, this is roughly 20% up here. If we come back across roughly about 30% of the items are increasing in price more than 10% at an annual rate. 5 to 10%, you're going from about, looks like 30%, somewhere around 60%. Another 30% are moving 5 to 10%. And then uh, the orange is uh, how much is moving 3 to 5%. This here is 2 to 3%, and then 0 to 2%. So you still have roughly 60% of the uh, PCE components that are moving uh, uh, more than 5%, uh, you know, and 30% of that is more than 10%. Let's have a look at that spreadsheet. So here it is. Uh, it gives you the color key down here. Cut from the bottom. This is included and cut from the top and it tells you what the trim point are. So these things are cut from the bottom. We can see window coverings. Annualized one month change. 38% gives you the weight 0.18% and then gives you a cumulative weighting as you're going down of how much weight was removed. Hotels and motels, beef and veal, televisions, motor vehicle, rental, all of these things dropped in price. Uh, and there's your cutoff uh, at a total cumulative weighting of 24.22%. So that uh, is the lower part of the price increases. Those are gone. And let's come down here to the cutoff point over here. And once you get past 11.3%, the rest is cut off. And that's getting cut off at the 69% mark, which means there's about 30% of weight down here. So 30% of weight down there, 24% of weight uh, being removed here you got about 45 percent left if we look at what we really went up in price i'm a little confused on a few things here line uh, 128 and line 129 line 128 is clothing repair rental and alterations i'm surprised that there is a category called clothing repair and clothing rental and that it's big enough to have its own line item. Who's renting clothes? Who's repairing clothes? I guess tuxedos. I guess if you think about tuxedos, all the graduates, all the graduations, all the weddings, and nobody really buys a tuxedo for that. I guess you rent it. The next one's got me. Repair and hire of footwear. Repair and hide, not, not buying footwear. Buying footwear is further down the list down here. If you uh, go down the list, you'll find, uh, there it is, shoes and other footwear, up 21% on an annualized basis. This is renting your footwear. Repair, repairing your footwear and renting your footwear. Again, I'm surprised that such a thing exists and that it's big enough to have its own line item. There's things you find, right? Uh, and then this is your trimmed mean uh, in here. And then it just calculates, based on these weightings, it just calculates what the trimmed mean PCE would be. And the thinking is this will have a better correlation with future inflation because it takes out the most volatile components of, uh, of, uh, of PCE, which is those things that drop a lot and those things that increase a lot. Uh, and it just leaves you uh, with the middle part. And we see that it is demonstrating more nearer term price momentum. So was the PCE index without trimming it was demonstrating more nearer term price momentum. And Q2 GDP over Q1 GDP on the price indexes was displaying that as well. So it does not seem that inflation is going in the right direction. Combine that with what we've had over the last week, which is a tremendous loosening of financial conditions and a Fed that is a reed and not an oak tree. Uh, what do you see coming up? I think you can go back in history to 1975 to 1978 under Arthur Burns and you can see exactly what happened. It did not get better. Uh, Arthur Burns uh, would raise rates uh, to counter inflation, but when he saw the economy softening, he ran over there and said, oh, 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 let's stop our rates and let's fix this over here. Okay, good, good. Let's prop this up. Whoops, inflation is running away. Let's let's run back over there. Let's, okay, down you go, down you go. Oh, oh hang on, the economy is dropping out. Let's run back. And it was this raise rates and stop. Oh, we were wrong. Raise rates and stop. Oh, we were wrong. Right? And the Fed lost all credibility. 
under Arthur Burns. No one believed that inflation was going to get under control. No one believed it. So you had inflation expectations that became embedded in the economy. And that is just what everybody expected. That that's just, this is just what it's going to be. Till Volcker came along and said, I can fix that. Let me fix inflation expectations very rapidly. And he was an oak tree. Uh, I think that Powell probably could have gotten out of the whole thing had he just not said the things he said. He still could have done what he wanted to do, but he gave up Fed credibility last week pretty much across the board with those two stupid statements. Okay, still on the PCE report, Table 3 gives us personal income and its disposition. This has changed from the preceding month. So if we look at June, this is the amount over May. And this is at a seasonally adjusted annual rate. So it's not as if it was an increase of 133.5 over May. It's the increase in June over May, if you annualize it, comes to 133.5 on personal incomes. And it gives you each category, compensation of employees in terms of wages and salaries, uh, and supplement to wages and salaries. These are benefits. So it breaks it down into private industry and uh, government. If we're looking at the cost index, we're not going to get that from here. You have to go to a different report uh, to get this. Um, headline is up 1.3. This is a quarter. This is for the quarter. So you take 1.013 and you put it to the power of 4 minus 1 to get an annual rate. Wages up 1.4. Benefits up 1.2. This is for all civilian. Uh, the ECI report will break it out in terms of all civilian. It'll give you government and it'll give you private. Governments don't compete on wages. That's why we want to strip it out and just look at what the cost index is for private business. When I say governments don't compete on wages, it means if there's a job listed that pays $93,456, first of all, any job that has this number here is formula driven. There is a very specific formula that gets to that number and that's what you're going to get. It's non-negotiable. So if you say, well, I can get 5,000 more working for this company over there. They say, well, thank you for coming out. Uh, next. And they call the next one in. However, they do have uh, good raises per year. They do have good benefits, good pension. So uh, there is something to say about government jobs, but they're not going to compete for employees. Private businesses. So if we're looking at the effect on uh, uh, companies because we're market oriented we don't really care what governments are doing we care about the expenses that private business is going to face so we'd like to strip it would like to take the all civilian which again doesn't include military take all the civilian and strip out all the government and just look at private let's go look at that report Okay, Table A, major series of the Employment Cost Index. And whenever you get to a table, you know, it's always worth taking just a little bit of time to figure out what all these columns are. What do we have here? Three-month, seasonally adjusted. We have March 2022, so there's Q1. We have June 2022, there's Q2. Categories, we have civilian workers. Number one, it tells you, includes private industry and state and local government. There's private industry here. There's state and local government there. Since this is three month seasonally adjusted to annualize it, it is to the power of four. So 1.3, here you have 1.4 and 1.2, wages and salaries versus benefits. This is 12 month, not seasonally adjusted current dollar, which means it's not adjusted for any um, CPI or PCE. It is just nominal dollars. There's June, there's March, there's uh, June 2022, 5.1%. Uh, 5.3 on wages, 4.8 on benefits. If you uh, adjust it, here it is right here, constant dollar. Whenever you see anything called constant dollar, it means within some base year. It's a constant dollar for that base year, not seasonally adjusted, constant dollar, all negative uh, in terms of uh, real uh, uh, numbers. However, corporations don't pay real wages, they pay nominal wages. And they don't report real earnings, they report nominal earnings. So if you have nominal revenues minus nominal wages to get to nominal earnings, this column doesn't mean anything to you. It's this column over here, uh, uh, if you're looking at an annualized, or this column over here. And we're not that interested in state and local government, so let's get them out of here. Look how low these, uh, these uh, cost indexes are. Look what happens over here. You go from 1.3 to 1.5. 
multiply that or put that to the power of, uh, of 4, uh, you're at 4.8, not 4.5, you're getting the 4.8. Um, if you um, look at wages and salaries, one, oh, sorry, not 4.8, sorry, 5.5. I'm looking under March over here, 5.5 5, um, versus 5.1. Uh, wages and salaries, 1.6 in the quarter versus 1.4, and benefits, 1.3 versus 1.2. You can see the extra price pressure in private industry and in having to compete for employees, but government doesn't have to compete for employees, so look how much lower it is. Now, is this going to let up anytime soon? With this, we want to combine it with the JOLTS report, which we're going to get next week. Tells us the amount of job openings uh, and tells us what the quits rate is. Well, this is not going to let up unless the quits rate drops. This is how many people quit per month. It's still over 4 million people quitting their job per month. And previous, in one of the previous updates, uh, we looked at the uh, Atlanta Fed's wage growth tracker. And we noted in the wage growth tracker that the highest wage gains are going to job switchers. Those people who quit their job and take another job because they got hired away. With a quits rate over 4.2 million, this pricing pressure is not going to abate. And this was a problem on Friday morning. Uh, it was noted that the annualized rate of PCE was still way too high. It was elevated and the cost index is elevated, indicating the potential for inflation to become embedded in wages. And you get what's called the price wage spiral. And that, was, uh, uh, that became entrenched under Arthur Burns. And as I've made very, very clear, Powell showed himself to be more Burns-like than Volcker-like with his statements uh, and his uh, idea that he has more mandates than price stability and full employment. Uh, there seems to be market support and there seems to be uh, no, uh, you know, a perfect soft landing. I said we'd do a soft landing. I pretty much have to do it now. I think that's why they got rid of forward guidance because they feel themselves shackled to actually making uh, come true what they said would happen. Uh, anyways, I think that is a, a little bit more illuminating that if we're looking for the true employment cost index that matters to us as investors, it's private industry, not all civilian workers that we care about. It's private industry and it is running hot. So the other story of the week last week was earnings. We had a big week of earnings, 172 companies uh, reporting earnings. I think, uh, where is it uh, down here? 153 companies are going to report earnings in the coming week. Um, let's just go right to the chart here. This is uh, earnings. Look at that. In the last week, this is where we were before the start of the week in terms of where we expect earnings to be. And after, uh, this is for Q2, and after what we saw last week, oh, no, no, it's way up here. So earnings are coming in better than what the forecasts were. This was earnings revisions downwards before the quarter began. Then the quarter started and it's like, oh, well, hang on. Things are a little bit better. No, things are really better. Uh, this is just uh, for the quarter. We're going to see that uh, revisions, there are downward revisions to EPS that they have come down 1%. Uh, but these came down as well, right? These came down as well and up we go. Uh, so if we look at uh, where we are on earnings versus expectations, 5.2% uh, coming in 5.2% better than expected. Uh, where is your big, uh, your big gainers? Consumer discretionary, 12.2%. Uh, Energy, we would expect that, 12.3%. Real estate, 11.3%. 11.3% on real estate. Let's look at revenues. Coming in 1.6% better. Utility, 17.6. Well, have you seen your bills lately? Uh, I got mine the other day. Um, I get it in email. I clicked on it. Went, oh, whoa. Okay. I mean, I can live with it, but I mean, it's still shocking uh, how much it's up. Let's go to page, uh, I think it's page eight uh, down here. And uh, we will look at the uh, next four quarters here. Here is earnings and revenue uh, uh, for, um, there it is. The forward four quarters, uh, 236.83 was 239 last week, 239 and change were 236.83. That is down 1% uh, 
uh, as far as uh, uh, the forward four quarters, uh, as far as for the forward four quarters. Um, and again, you go right to the end, it gives you the earnings calendar. Here's Monday's earnings calendar. You only have a few before, uh, we, before we open, nothing really big to look at. Lowe's is in there. And then you have a bunch after the bell, uh, and that's when everything starts. And then, of course, Tuesday, you have a whole bunch before the bell as well. A lot before the bell, a lot after the bell. So a lot of companies reporting next week. Next week is big on uh, ISM data. Not too many big uh, reports all the way into Friday when we get jobs data, but we'll look at that shortly. So here we are uh, on the SPY. I've got our levels out here. Uh, the index ended at 4130.29. Our new forward earnings, 236.83, gives us uh, almost 17 and a half times earnings on the index, slightly above the five year uh, average, a bit above the 10 year average. This is versus 239.37 a week ago. So uh, they've come down 1.06%. So we've come down on uh, the denominator has dropped and the numerator has increased over the last week, uh, which gets us to 17 and a half. 18x is sitting uh, just a little bit below 4,300 if we get to 18x. As far as rallies so far in this bear market, our first rally, um, when I look at the chart, a wider chart so that I can see what's the lowest closing day, what's the highest uh, closing day to figure out the rallies. Your first rally was a 6.5% rally, and then you hit new lows, followed by a 10.45% rally, then you hit new lows, which then created a 7.3% rally, then you hit new lows. This is a 12.3% rally now. This is rally number four. It's very common for bear markets to have multiple rallies, sometimes of, of 10, even 15%. This is the strongest rally we've had in this bear market. The, uh, the, the other one was 10.45, uh, which then just led to uh, significantly new lows. Uh, 7.3 up, which led to new lows. We're 12.3% uh, up on this rally here. We're sitting currently at 17.5 times forward earnings. Financial conditions have... Uh, uh, um, uh, um, you know, became more accommodative over the last two weeks. Treasury yields are down, real rates are turning negative, mortgage rates are down, earnings are coming in 5.6% better than, uh, than expected. Um, you volatility, uh, this is from the high of uh, June 14th when we hit the, the low uh, from where we are now. We have a drop of 9% in implied volatility, which means fear is subsiding. Uh, I don't know that this is anything more than yet another bear market rally because I just can't see how we have not solved any of the inflation issues. Employment cost index is coming in uh, very hot. Uh, PCE on a monthly annualized basis is coming in very hot. Stripping out food and energy is coming in very hot. The trimmed mean PCE is increasing as we decrease the amount of time that we uh, look back in the past over, uh, signifying that we have price momentum in our price increases. Yes, we have negative GDP in the first and second quarter, but we've seen that these are anomalies. That if we just take, if we just remove that change in inventories and say, well, look, that's just a change in inventory. Inventory still grew by 80 billion. They just didn't grow by the 188 billion to, to equal 0% change quarter over quarter. So that led to a 2% decrease in real GDP, even though you had increased activity in inventories because you still had a build, just not as big a build as you want. So if you say, well, that's a, you know, we can excuse that because if they're wrong, they're going to have to overbuild in Q3 and Q4 anyways. Uh, so I don't think that we really had negative uh, GDP yet. Just the way that it's added together, yes, we had negative GDP. Had all of that inventory in the first quarter not hit uh, the shores in, in, you know, had hit at other time periods, maybe you would have had that big effect in Q1. So, uh, you know, I think that you have a very strong consumer. You have an extremely strong labor market. 
Uh, I don't anticipate that to roll over anytime soon. You have the quits rate over 4.3 million, and we know that the uh, job, uh, the wage growth tracker shows that they're getting the highest gains. Does anyone think that this is anything more than a bear market rally at this point? The only condition under which you think, no, it could be a more sustained rally, is if you say the Fed will move from ought, I think I spelt that right, eh? A A. A-O-U-G-H-D, or should, let's say should, I can spell should, will move from should to will. In other words, they should do something, but they will do something else. Uh, because uh, we have to now include the incompetence of the Fed. And if the Fed is going to be incompetent, uh, this could uh, be a uh, slightly longer rally. But you do have Fed speak coming up. So maybe the other uh, uh, people on the board uh, will, uh, you know, after they take their heads out of their hands, like they probably buried their heads in their hands during that press conference that says, why would you say it? They're probably going to come out and maybe they're going to talk tough saying, no, 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 our job is nowhere near done because you got to work on expectations. Fine, maybe you don't want to raise those rates, but you got to work on expectations. Think about it this way. Let's say I want you to do something and I'm holding a gun to your head. I need you to believe that I am going to pull that trigger. I need you to believe it because I want you to do a certain thing. But if I say, look, I'm not really going to pull the trigger, but uh, you go ahead and do what I'm telling you to do. Well, I just lost credibility. I, now, I can't, now I can't re-threaten you with something because you already know that I don't have it in me. That's the problem with speaking, with saying exactly what's on your mind sometimes, uh, you know, is, is you lose that credibility because the market realizes that you don't have it in you to do what you should do, and that you will do what you will do. So over here, it's kind of a question mark now is, well, should I bet on the dual mandate of the Fed? And if I do, I got to fade this rally. Or should I bet on the weakness of the man? And if I bet on the weakness of the man, this rally still got room to grow. Let's look at our uh, week ahead. All right, let's uh, look what we have. Lots of PMI stuff coming in this week. And I think China already reported its PMI number. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't good. And this was for manufacturing. Uh, so... Um, we have uh, S&P Global Manufacturing uh, and ISM Manufacturing. These are just two different ways to track uh, the same thing. Uh, ISM seems to get a lot more attention. And then you have construction spending. These are important because these are for July. Uh, construction spending June, well, we've already seen GDP. So I don't know that there's too much new information we're going to get out of any uh, June report. Let's keep going. Um, Evans on uh, Tuesday, this will be interesting. Is he going to push back against the dovishness of Powell? Is he going to be an oak tree? Is he going to be another reed? That'll be interesting. Uh, here it is, the uh, job openings and the job quits. Uh, uh, this is still forecast to be 11 and the quits rate is still over 4 million. If we look at, uh, I think we can get a previous chart up here. Uh, and you can see that it's been elevated over 4 million for quite some time, which is extremely high. So if this comes in still over 4 million and we have job openings uh, over 11 million, that's still a very tight labor market. Uh, total vehicle sales for July, that'll be interesting. Uh, the previous was 13 million. Mortgage applications, that's not going to reflect the softening. This is uh, uh, for uh, up to the end of uh, July. 29th, but rates really only increased at the end of last week, so I don't know that it's going to show too much. I think the week after will show uh, last week's uh, softening of uh, mortgage rates. Here are your um, PMIs uh, uh, for the U.S. Uh, global. This is your services PMI, and this is the ISM non-manufacturing uh, followed with factory orders. And then you don't really have anything uh, interesting uh, uh, for the rest of the week, you have balance of trade, but this is for June. We've already seen the, uh, the second quarter GDP, so uh, exports and imports, I don't think there's any new information in there. Continuing, uh, sorry, not continuing jobless claims, but initial jobless claims uh, are becoming a little bit interesting. Let me show you the, uh, the chart from the beginning of the year on initial jobless claims. 
Uh, and uh, this is uh, end of March, beginning of April, and we've seen that initial jobless claims have been creeping upwards. However, not really enough to overcome the idea that 4.3 million people are still quitting their job because they can get other jobs. So I'm not sure this is interesting yet. Uh, Mester is uh, um, uh, on that day as well. And then the big day is Friday where you have your labor report. Uh, and if this comes in, you know, the forecast is for 250, anything under 100, you know, especially if it's negative, well, yeah, okay, so you see the job market weakening. I can't see the job market weakening when you have a quits rate over 4.3 million and you have job openings of 11 point some million. I simply just, I don't have the math to make that work. This comes in at uh, 275, 300, 350. The Fed, the Fed's mandate uh, on um, the job market is covered. It only has one other mandate and that's it. We'll see. We will see if they follow it. Uh, so the two, uh, the two Fed speakers this week will be interesting and this number will be interesting as well. Uh, and consumer credit change. I still expect that to grow. This is for June. Uh, consumer credit has just gone up every single month. It's, it's never showed a, a decrease. It just keeps going up and up. Uh, this is for uh, June. Again, I don't know that there's too much interesting information in there. But non-farm payrolls is for July, which is the first month of the third quarter. Here you're going to get a whole bunch of other information as well. This is what I'm watching, the participation rate. It has been kind of ticking down by 0.1, but still in the wrong direction. The problem here is the retiring generation is much larger than the incoming generation. Uh, and there's nothing you can do to fix that. You cannot manufacture more 18-year-olds. You can see if uh, some people are delaying their retirement. That would keep the participation rate up. But you need people to come into the workforce. Those who are leaving with retirement are greater than the number of, of uh, uh, just just by size of the age cohort are larger than those coming in. So that means that you have to get other people to come into the labor force. When you have a situation like this, you typically solve it with immigration because that's how you manufacture more 20 year olds is with immigration. Even if you increase the birth rate now, you're not going, they're not going to be born at 25. You got to wait 25 years before they're of that age cohort. And that means that the current generation has to have more children than the size of the cohort that they are when they can't afford a house. I don't think that's going to happen. So I don't know that the participation rate is going to go back up. And if this keeps ticking down, you could have a situation where the participation rate keeps dropping um, and unemployment does not drop at all, even though you might have tepid job growth, but the unemployment rate won't creep up because the participation rate creeps down, keeping the, in, the employment cost index elevated, much like you have housing prices that are elevated because you have a shortage, you have another um, sort of structural, I'm not even going to call it a cyclical, cyclical shortage at this point, I think you have a structural shortage here. Anyways, uh, you have earnings next week. I don't know that, that it's going to change the tone of earnings so far. Usually when you get past about 250 of the S&P components reporting, there's, there's not much that can change the tone going forward, especially if we've had earnings from, uh, you know, that are well represented across the 11 sectors, which we have. I don't think there's much that's going to change the tone of earnings now. The only thing that can change next week is the tone of Fed speak. And we have two, there are two opportunities to get that done. Um, the weaker the economy is, if those PMIs come in weak, that's just more fuel for the fire that, that uh, on September, maybe you'll only get 25 basis points and then they'll be done. Maybe they'll start cutting rates even sooner and the market will rally on that because bad news is good news and good news is good news. Until we're told otherwise, every bit of news is good news. If it's good, it's good. If it's bad, that's good. Only the Fed, only those two Fed uh, speakers uh, can do something to change that. If you are looking for a change in this bear market rally, if you do think it's a bear market rally that's going to end soon, the only cards you have are those two speakers. 
I don't think any of the other cards work. Well, that's it for the week.